everybody, welcome. Um, you know, I, I think I've said this before at a couple of talks that I've uh, uh, been a part of that uh, when I introduce the speaker, I tell the attendees that they're among the luckiest people at Harvard at that particular moment in time. I now think you're among the luckiest people on the East Coast uh, because we get to hear uh, from Professor uh, Al Stepan, who is actually a man who uh, needs no introduction, and so that uh, makes my job um, uh, difficult. What do you say about uh, somebody who has been so instrumental in building the field of comparative political science uh, in contributing to these, uh, to answers to these very important questions about how we get democracy and how we keep it? Um, and Al has uh, contributed research on these questions in a variety of contexts. He's a Brazilianist by training, but um, he has traveled widely throughout the world and teaches people who study Egypt all about Egypt and people who study Tunisia all about Tunisia. So we are really thrilled uh, to have him here to talk about uh, building democracy in Muslim majority countries. And so without further ado, I'll turn it over to Professor Stefan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cody. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, the title of your series this semester is Democracy in Hard Places. My topic is democracy in Muslim majority countries, hard, but absolutely not impossible places. I so we have to think about it. Uh, about a decade ago, I wrote an article called An Arab Not a Muslim Democratic Deficit. Uh, by this, I meant that for 30 years, there was not a single Arab majority country that groups like Freedom House or Polity 4 or scholars like my colleague Juan Lenz and myself would consider a democracy. But we also noted that at one time or another, almost 10 Muslim majority democracies, Muslim majority countries, met these same standards uh, in, in, for at least three years in a row. As of December 2011, at the start of the Arab Spring, this was still so. I want you to take a look at uh, table one. No, not table two. Okay. Thank you. Uh, this is a reason we, it's not a terrifically high standard, but it's fairly high. Most majority countries with 10 consecutive years of moderately high political rights and electoral rights between 2001 and 2010. That by that, never lower than a plus 10 on policies, 21 points scale, and never lower in any one of the 10 years than three on the Freedom House political rights scale. In the non Arab Muslim countries, you've got Indonesia, Mali, Albania, Senegal, and Turkey, and I'll give you a reason why I'm putting it in India. In, in, in. And you notice you don't have one single Arab country. Okay? Well, let's see the next one. Okay, here's Freedom House political rights scores for 17 Arab Muslim majority countries in the year 2000. One, the highest score, none. Two, none. Three, none. Uh, the highest is Kuwait at four. The average in the whole set is six. Okay, turn off. Now, methodologic, what are we, what are we demonstrated and not demonstrated by those two tables? Well, if you have an entire set, which I do, and you can subdivide the set into two subsets, which have some strikingly different political outcomes, uh, methodologically, the major variable they share in common, in this case, Islam, cannot in itself fully explain this variance. We're going to have to really look at politics. I'm not going to go into the economics, but as socioeconomics doesn't, the Arabs are richer than the non-Arabs. Substantial. So Lipset, Shaborsky, they, they can't help us analyze that question, that variation. Okay. So, I mean, they have Mali, they have Senegal, these are some of the poorest countries on the planet. Okay. So today, what I'm going to explore, we're going to think about politics in these Muslim-majority countries that have actually somehow managed to construct models. This is an under-theorized point. We've got volume after volume about why it's impossible or terrorism, but in cases where they've actually constructed democracy, I think we should try to learn as much as we can from that and, and see what happens. Now, 
if, as you notice, I've also added India to the set. Uh, obviously, India is Hindu, not Muslim majority. But its politics had to relate to the demographic fact that right before independence, India had the, the most numerous Muslim population of any country in the world. It had more Muslims than, than Indonesia at that point, and uh, <coughs> Pakistan and Bangladesh and India, so they were inside of China, so in, in India. Even today, uh, India's 160 million Muslims has only surpassed in the entire world by Indonesia and Pakistan. So India has the third largest Muslim population. So, it could have not have been a long-standing democracy unless it related to this somehow, and unless Muslims contributed to this in some way. 60 million. Now, before examining democracies in these countries, let's first look at what is actually required from, from, religion, from religions towards democracy and from democracy towards religion in any country of the world. Uh, I'm not a relativist about this. I think if you, if you are of a democracy, this is you're going to say in any country in the world, here are the two requirements. Uh, and they're both more than some people think and much less than some people think. And that's what I call the twin tolerations. Um, and uh, <clears throat> well, I'll, I'll get back to this, you know, get back to twin tolerations. But many people start by talking about after the strong separation of church and state. They really think that is the bedrock of, of secularism and therefore democracy. And they think Islam is going to have more of a problem with this than anybody else. Even Ernest Gellman said Islam's, uh, the Muslims are secular resistant. Okay. Now, if you accept, however, that the current 27 members of the European Union are all democracies, it should be immediately apparent that is empirically and conceptually nonsense to insist that democracy requires a strict separation of the church and state. Contemplate for a second, table three. This is an actual 100% uh, of the 27 monsters, all 27 of them in the European Union, have government funding of religious schools or education. Uh, official government department for religious affairs, 67. Government positions or funding for clergy, 44%. Something like Belgium talks eight different uh, religions. Government funding and established religion, almost 20% of all the long state democracies have established churches. So this is really something we, we have to think about and we can't, uh, because many people will think of the Trump statement that look, democracy requires an absolute separation of church and state, Islam can't do it, you're not going to be able to count like this. Okay, close enough. Now, conceptually, empirically, and historically, our discussion of democracy and religion will also be helped if, just as Sir Eisenstadt and Sudeep de Kavaraj argue in, in the Daedalus article that we should not speak of modernity in the singular, but we should speak of multiple modernities, I would either not like to talk about secularism I, I think my concept of twin toleration, you don't need it. But if you do use the word secularism, it absolutely should be multiple secularism, just like there are multiple modernities. Okay, in some senses, European democracy are all democratic in church-state relations, but they have at least three different subtypes of secularism. Uh, and only one of these is separatist and it only has two of the 27 countries. Uh, hard secularism. The French 1905 laïcité, uh, often thought that under the Turkish, uh, which is a non-democratic variety of laïcité, and the completion of the Iron Triangle was in Tunisia, uh, which really had authoritarian secularism imposed uh, from above. But uh, 1905, France, 1922-23, Turkey, 1956, Burkina, that's a link of modernism, uh, barely on the side of, uh, only in the case of France, democratic, but calling itself secularism. So it's undemocratic secularism. Established church. All of the countries normally seen as the most inclusive and democratically tolerant of the European Union. I'm speaking of the Scandinavian welfare states. Every single one of them 
until Sweden in 2000 had an established evangelical Lutheran church as the official church. Uh, they were burning uh, Baptists as late as the 1880s in, uh, in, in, uh, in Sweden. Okay, so this didn't, didn't, didn't come immediately, uh, and, and, uh, but it's not democratic, but it wasn't always. Then they have a third form that is very important, but people don't know much about it. I call it positive accommodation. Positive accommodation, the German constitutional theorist, the most famous German thinker of church-state relations, Gerhard Robers, R-O-B-D-E-R-S, argues that neutrality for religion in Germany means, quote, positive accommodation. The concept of positive accommodation obliges the state to actively support religion. As part of the positive accommodation, the state aids the Lutheran and Catholic churches, collecting 8% tax surcharge that goes directly to the Lutheran and Catholic churches, making them possibly the most the richest churches in the world. Variants of positive accommodation are in Belgium, Holland, Switzerland, and Austria. Uh, and if we don't understand this, we really just don't understand European patterns of church relations. Now, all of these patterns, separatist, established church, and positive accommodationist, are non-democratic, they weren't always, but they are uh, non-democratic in that they respect what I call the twin tolerations. Very briefly by the twin tolerations, I simply mean, I wrote a 40-page version, but this will be a two-minute version. Two-minute version uh, is simply that Religion must respect and tolerate the sovereignty of democratic citizens when they elect re legislators and, and their vote. Democracy itself has to be respected and tolerated by religion. And on the other side, what do we do, what should we have a right to expect in terms of democratic theory of democracy from religion? Some people said you have to take it. Religion must be only private. We all said it best to try to take it off the public agenda. To take it off the public agenda means people really cannot participate. Religious citizens cannot fully participate and talk about their goals and ideals and aspirations in civil society. That doesn't seem very democratic to me. And also, Christian democracy in Western Europe, which was a booming block for the European Union, was uh, political society, uh, involved in political society. We, we need to think about that. Uh, so, political society, you know, the democracy must tolerate the lower religion, and religion must tolerate the democracy. Now, the twin tolerations can encompass many patterns of church-state relations. Uh, I, I will argue towards the end of my talk that I believe Tunisia is, is, an, is, is constructing a twin toleration friendly form of religion state relations. Now, the, with the exception of separatist and the Turkish Laisite in Turkey, none of the democracies that currently exist in the Western in Western Europe are remotely close to the democracies of the sort that Muslim majorities or democratic India with large Muslim problems. Actually, they don't fit in easily to any one of these three. They're democracies, but they don't fit into any one of those. But since we're accepting the idea of multiple secularisms and multiple modernities, are there, are there other types of secularism, if we want to use that word, that is compatible with democracy and compatible with the twin coalitions? Uh, yes, there is. And it's pretty amazing. Uh, and that is that I'm going to call it, I'm going to call this pattern lost a lot of pages there. Um, well, I know what I'm saying, but I'll find it eventually. Um, all, I'll call this pattern uh, respect all, basically support all, have active uh, crap policy with, but still maintain what we call of principal distance. You don't accept them all. Now, what I mean by the fact of accept all and, and 
and the sabre ball is the fact that when you take a look at the Western European countries, uh, all of them have obligatory, compulsory, paid public holidays for religious holidays. But 100% of those holidays, and there are over 100 of them, are all for Christian religions. There's zero, zero for Judaism, zero uh, for uh, Islam, despite in some countries you have a significant population. This simply wasn't in. Now, now what is interesting is in the Muslim majority countries or India, where you're having, you're trying to relate to people who care about religion intensely. You want to accept the legitimacy of religion in that space and really recognize, in Charles Taylor's sense, recognize them and really have some co-celebrations. Take a look at this table. Okay, this is the three Western states. Here is what I just told you. Denmark has 11 holidays for the majority of religion. Norway, 10. Sweden, uh, Turkey, the United States, and France, the separatist ones, are the lowest. But notice that bottom line, paid religious holidays for minority religion. Across the board, every one of those models, it's a zero, 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 zero. Show me the next one. Comparison of paid religious holidays in the list. Here's my respect all set. India, Indonesia, Senegal. What's fascinating about this is Indonesia has more paid religious holidays for minority religions than it does for the majority. Senegal only has now 6% Catholics, but they get almost as many holidays as the 94%. Uh, and they pay for people that they pilgrims, to religious just the wrong. Uh, and uh, India has twice as many for minority religions as they have. So this is the respect all pattern, it's radically different. Uh, this, this also spills over to holidays, education, funding, and so on. Um, for example, in, uh, if we take a look at policy and, and policy cooperation, this is another <coughs> pattern of this, not only respect all, but policy cooperation with, between religions and the state, any type of religion. Now, for reasons of space, and because I've carried out extensive field work in India, Indonesia, and Senegal, I restrict my remarks to these three countries on this issue. More than Germany or Switzerland, the respect all countries of Senegal, uh, Indonesia, and India give state aid to help almost all religions carry out some of their activities. In India, as Dean Smith has stressed, the idea that governments should not extend financial aid or other forms of patronage to religion finds no support in Hindu, Buddhist, or Islamic traditions. Also, during certain periods in the 18th and 19th century, grants of money were given by the British government for the support of Hindu temples and Muslim mosques. Constitution of Independent and Democratic India kept the tradition of some financial support for all religions. It's right there in Article 3. Um, significantly, the positive storm, uh, the positive dimension of this norm of the state helping religious minorities fulfill their religious duties is so entrenched in India that even a pretty nasty Hindi, Hindu fundamentalist BJP government wouldn't dare stop the Indian tradition of subsidies to help Muslims make the pilgrimages to Mecca. This was maintained all through. There are only three airports in Delhi. There's the International Airport, the Domestic Airport, and the Bailey, and the most active during the Hajj is the Hajj Airport. This is absolutely a normal part of, of Indian life in this sense, of the respect all, collaborate with all. In Indonesia, Hindu, Buddhist, Confucian, Catholic, and Protestant organizations, as well as Muslim ones, can apply for financial support to carry out their functions to the section in the Ministry of Religion dedicated to their religion. I don't think they get a huge amount, but I, I've talked to them all, about the, the heads of each one, each organization, the, the bishop, so they, they all go there, they all get some money for things that support their religion. In, the, in Indonesia in particular, and he was my great friend here, he, we spent a day traveling around two days. Uh, the combination of very inclusive, positive accommodation towards religions with some financial aid to religious schools has opened the way to forms of active policy-making cooperation between the respect of all secular state and religions. For example, Indonesia, if a religious school wants official recognition, there has recently been a growing process of consensual co-design of books, including books about religion, including books about the history of Islam, by state authorities, 
from the Ministry of Education and religious leaders from major Muslim organizations, the 40 million, 40 million member NU, 30 million Mohammedia. Uh, Indonesia is, as the current article by Fish in Journal of Democracy, is the highest joining society in the world. And many of the things that they're members of are religious organizations, but they join other organizations. Okay. Um, the positive engagement of both the state and religious organizations in providing education has resulted in the fact that basic literacy for boys and girls is now virtually universal by the time they reach the age of 15. Indeed, the World Development Indicators of the World Bank, in the most recent publication, give data for young women aged 15 to 25 and young men of the same age, and there's only one percentage point in the difference in literacy. The young girls are 98%, and the young boys are 99%. This is pretty close. This wouldn't have happened even 15 or 20 years ago. This is a function of people, of, church, of, of books being made that they can use, girls being feeling it's safe to go to the state schools and accept it. And In Senegal, the state provides free public schooling for close to 85% of all primary school age children. Since 2003, some of the state schools offer religious instruction using authorized textbooks that are never Wahhabi in spirit. With the approval of secular uh, state officials and Sufi teachers alike, more and more parents are increasingly sending their sons and now their daughters to these tolerant, accredited, and democracy capable, compatible schools. Um, there's also a, a lot of policy cooperation. I won't go into great detail, but in, 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 there are a couple of great case studies in Senegal. Uh, one, the one in the anti-female uh, general mutilation case, and the other one in the AIDS. In the anti-female general mutilation, uh, international uh, feminist groups and domestic sector groups were really trying to do something about it, but they weren't making much of it. They finally decided to ask uh, the person in charge of communications and doctrine uh, for uh, Tijania, which is the largest of the four Sufi orders in Senegal, if he would assess a very, if, even if it took him a year, do a really serious reading of everything in the Quran, everything in the Quran, how, how does, what does it say about general mutilation? He, he took it seriously. Finally wrote around a 36 page report. 36 page report said, <coughs> done everything, and there's nothing in the Quran that legitimates this. There's no evidence in the Hadith that uh, Muhammad's wife, daughters, and the, and the wives of his, his colleagues had this. So this, then, is no Quranic imperative, but there's almost a moral ishtihad imperative. And think creatively about this, and what are the implications? And he says, since we know, it's, we now know it's terrible for people's health, and it also denies a normal right to, it's a disfiguring of their natural body, and it make, probably makes many people less able to enjoy uh, marital relations. And why should women have equal marital relations? This is a heck on a basic human thing. So he wrote that. But he, they were able to dis then he distribute it, he had work groups, and then together, the secular state members, a few of the international feminist organizations, and the, the Sufi leaders went village by village, hundreds of villages, and basically doing an Indian foot binder, Chinese foot binding type thing in marriage communities. Because if you change something like this, if, if you're not going to get married, if you're not generally mutilated, then you've got to do it in the foot binding Chinese way with brand. They did the same thing in AIDS. I won't go through it, but the, the element of policy cooperation, this, that's a twin toleration is compatible. I think it's also democracy compatible. It may violate French idea of secularism, but uh, I don't think it violates human dignity. Okay, principle this is something quite uh, short. Brief about the question of principal discipline because the concept has been brilliantly developed by my colleague, the Indian political theorist, Rajiv Bhargava. Uh, I've been going to India once a year for the last over 10 years now. India and also to a lesser extent, Indonesia and Senegal all have versions of a secular state that can impose, if necessary, some normative and constitutional constraints on religious majoritarianism and or possible religious violations of human rights by following the norm of principal distance. Along with Pragaga, I use the word principal distance not to mean the normal equal distance or totally neutrality between all religions. Because why should it be equal distance? If some religion is violating people's rights and the other one isn't, what's democratic about saying you have to maintain equal distance between the 
torturing religion and the non-torturing religion. So I, I think, so the, the idea of the principal distance makes a lot more difference than neutrality uh, or of equal distance. Um, for example, many of the Indian leaders at independence, including the chairman of the drafting committee, Ambedkar, who was untouchable, he said, hey, religion is public religion. And if you're an untouchable and you can't go into a temple, that's an obscenity. This is a violation of people's rights. We're going to put it right in the Constitution, they did in Article 25, that in the classic principle of principal distance, uh, that, that, that there is nothing about in the Constitution about religious freedom that should prevent throwing open Hindu religious institutions of a public character to all classes and sections uh, of Hindus. We have untouchables. Okay. Um, now, some people feel that this subsidizing all religions, uh, recognizing all religions, and supporting them all, uh, in a context like India, where, where there's, there is a certain growing uh, intensity of religious practice, and people are worried that the intensity of religious practices will contribute to declining support for democracy. Well, all you have to do is step back and you can formulate that as a testable hypothesis. You can create an index, low, medium, high, intensity of religious practice, and an index, low, medium, high, of intensity of support for democracy. What are the results say? The results say the following. For every religion in India, the greater the intensity of religious practice, the greater the support for democracy. This is not a tiny end. It's 27,000. It's a three-star finding for all the religions. Three stars. That means it's one chance in a thousand that they have by chance. This is powerful. Uh, turn that off. Um, what? Um, but by the way, somewhat similar findings about the relation between the intensity of religious practice and the support for Mahathir were found by Saiful Mujani, uh, Indonesia's most respected public opinion poll specialist and the Indonesian coordinator of the Asian Bloc. For his Ohio State PhD, he basically did that study, a version of it for Indonesia, independently of us. Uh, his results were extremely similar. Uh, in Lujani's data and regressions, he found that high-practicing Muslims joined more organizations, both bonding among active Muslim citizens and bridging with secular citizens. So bonding and bridging organizations than did low practicing Muslims. That respondents who joined more organizations trusted people more than those who joined fewer. That respondents who trusted people more trusted the state more. And respondents who trusted the state more trusted democracy. Okay. How do Indian Muslims in the sixth Indian How do they compare with Hindus on some of our standard answers? Then and I have a five part question for support for democracy that we've given fifteen times in India, in, in Latin America, and he's given in Spain. Uh, it's this one. And it, the results are pretty interesting. Uh, 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 India has, India basically is very comparable uh, to Spain, uh, much better in support for democracy than Korea, Chile, and Brazil. My beloved Brazil, where I wrote three books, has never had 50% of people who say that they would support democracy under all circumstances, whereas uh, in India it's 60%. Now, there's also very low support for authoritarian government in India. In some circumstances, authoritarian government can be preferred to democratic government. The lowest one on the whole step is India in 2004 with 4%. Chile, 18%. Because the people who supported the coup uh, against Salvador Allende aren't dead yet. So they're going through the body of Indian body politics, so they're there. The reason why 23% of the people in India in Brazil, say for someone like me, a democratic or non-democratic regime makes no difference, is it had both types. And they've been miserably poor in both of them, so it doesn't make any difference. But very few Indians say that. Only six say that, compared to 23%. That doesn't cheer me up, but I, I, I'll recognize it. That goes on. Um, okay, let's shift to something that uh, is very current. Let me make a, ma so on a major shift to the Arab world, because we started out with that really dismal thing. Now, I never believed, I, my purpose in writing that was not to 
It was not anti-Arab essentialism. It was not that they can't be. It was an empirical stack that by three different ways of measuring, everyone comes up that there isn't one. That's an empirical statement. That doesn't mean it has to happen. As a matter of fact, I've been more interested in a breakthrough in the Arab world than any other part of the world. So you can imagine when I was asked by some of the activists, could can they find someone to go to Egypt and Tunisia who can talk about five failed transitions and maybe five successful ones? I was on the airplane the next day. Uh, and, and so I, since then I've been in Tunisia in March, in June, in November, and again soon, and I've been in Egypt twice. Okay. I'm not an expert, but between Liz and myself, we have written about maybe 20 different countries. And so how do I see Tunisia in this comparative perspective? Linz and I obviously assert that most democratic transitions are never completed. And even if they are, much, there's much more political, economic, and social work that has to be carried out before a country can be seen as democratically consolidated. Now, obviously, Tunisia is not a consolidated democracy. I'm not saying that. They make a distinction between a consolidated democracy and a democratic transition. But what I am saying is that and I'll, get, and I'll tell you exactly what they are later. But of the four things in the third paragraph of page one of problems of democratic transition and consolidation, we defined a completed democratic transition. I'd forgotten we had defined it. So I went back and checked it out. We said there are four things. Tunisia, in my judgment, and I hope to use the next 15 minutes to convince you that Tunisia has already done all four. By the way, Egypt hasn't done all. So that opens up a series of comparative analysis because uh, something happened roughly at the same time, a lot about it, and so on. Now, I think they completed the fourth one on December 23rd, when free and fairly, free and fairly elected constituent assembly endorsed and appointed the new government, and the government uh, began to govern without any constitutional constraints uh, on it, uh, either religious constraints or restraints from the military. Okay. Now, why was Tunisia able to do this so quickly? And why hasn't Egypt been able to? I'm not going to talk much about Egypt. We have a great Egyptian scholar here, and we have a short time. But I'll, I'll use some of the categories that I would use if I had a, a longer explanation to explain the variance. I have an article coming out in April uh, on Tunisia. I wanted to have it in Egypt. They said, we're going to get better Egyptian specialists, probably Tariq. <laughs> 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 and, 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 and my articles are always too short. But, but, but I'll, I'll say at least what I argued and try to argue. Okay. Much of the reason for the comparative Tunisian success is that both Islamic and secular leaders have worked to overcome their mutual fears and distrust by crafting agreements and credible guarantees in political society. In the process, they have begun to reconstruct the twin tolerations friendly secularism that actually, I believe, was to some extent emerging in 19th century Tunisia but was absolutely destroyed by Tunisian secularist, modernizing fundamentalist between 1956 and 2011, Burkina. He's a real modernizing fundamentalist, uh, authoritarianism. Now, in what follows, I've organized my analysis around three hypotheses. They hardly make up the whole story of Tunisia's transition, but they do draw attention to areas where Tunisia's successes contrast strongly with Egypt's initial failures in the transition. To fail in the first transition doesn't mean you're always going to fail, but it's, I want to recognize that there is difference. I think what happened in Tarara Square will never go away. The, the military sense that they own the country, people don't believe that. So even if they can't construct the democracy right now, the military's assumption that they're the owners of Egyptian public policy will never return, I think. However, uh, Tunisia still has gone much further than what we say why. Now, um, the three hypotheses we'll look at very quickly. First, the religious hypothesis. In countries where religious conflict is likely to be salient, the greater the degree before or soon after the start of an attempted democratic transition, the major religion-based political parties and the major secular parties have made significant movements towards accepting both of the core requirements of the twin tolerations greater the chance of a successful democratic transition. What's fascinating about Indonesia is the two huge organizations, the 40 million and the 30 million Mohammedan, 
had become essentially democratic before the democratic before the transition started. Tunisia hasn't gone that far, but something happened before the transition that we'll get and talk about. Now, empirically, uh, this means that the major religiously based parties do not argue that God made law is superior to man, which would violate the first major tenet of the twin tolerations. It also means that the major secular parties do not deny the right of religiously based citizens to articulate the values democratically in civil and political society, a denial which would violate the second major requirement of the twin tolerations, where Ema violated many religious citizens' rights because he actually believed that religion had to be off the public agenda and enforce it. Second, the civil military analysis. Uh, my first three books were on military and security issues, mainly in Brazil, break down democracy and resistance against military and so From the viewpoint of democratization, in my judgment, the most important aspect of the military to study is not the military, it's civil military relations. Empirically, this means because in most of the cases in Latin America that I spent the first decade or so of my life studying, almost all coups came with great civilian support, almost a grammarian application of responsibility for the military. Yeah. It was an exchange of power for security. And you give that the support to the military. So civil military relations make coups possible. And as a matter of fact, even, even possible in some cases. Okay. In character, this means that the less the civilians advocate their right to rule to the military in an 18th premier type of exchange for what they perceive as security from threats from class or religious rivals that might be produced by the monarchy, the greater the chance of a successful and military unconstrained democratic transition. Third, the political society hypothesis. This states that empirically, I love civil society, but civil society can't make the whole democratic transition. There's a group of people who have to talk about constitutional parties, organized parties, organized elections. And, and you, civil society, if, civil, if all the major people are in civil society and hate political society, this time around, you're not going to have a democratic transition. Uh, and the, in many countries, that's a big traditional problem. Now, the political society hypothesis states that empirically, the greater the degree to which political actors and parties craft among themselves or agree to the rules of the game for contestation for democratic political power, the greater the chance of a successful democratic transition. In my reading of the first year of the Arab Spring, all three of these mutually reinforcing processes are reinforcing. Hold for Tunisia on the positive side. And on the negative side, all three of them reinforcing processes hold for the future. The religious hypothesis. The largest and best organized and most influential party in the post Ben Ali in Tunisia is an Islamic influence and not a Renaissance party. In March 2011, right after my interviews in Egypt uh, with some members of the newly liberated press and several of the leading secularists, uh, I found in both countries, a, both of them were frightened, more frightened in Egypt than in Tunisia, but even Tunisia was frightened <coughs> by the prospect of elections because they saw between one by uh, and so now I found many of these people were in, even in Tunisia extremely frightened by the prospect of free elections and of another victory. Indeed, some of those I interviewed were toying with Marian options, Mir name, namely the option of changing the possibility of democratic city and rule for the security protection offered by an authoritarian body in this case. However, within a month in Tunisia, Marianism had begun to receive. We want to look at why that happened. It did not happen, but it happened. It intensified in the same period when I went back. In 1997, I'm going backwards now, I've interviewed four or five times in London, uh, Rashid Benucci. Uh, he was in exile. I'm not saying I was in exile at All Souls College, Oxford, but I was a Gladstone professor of government, uh, and we both were on a panel. We began talking. We talked many times. He came up to All Souls, which he found profoundly boring. Uh, he kind of identified kind of with St. Anthony's, which he liked a lot more. Uh, but we had a lot of exchange. He's one of the people I actually interviewed. He was quote, in the, say the interviews in the Twin Tolerations. I cite him. He's one of the, the religious figures. Okay. On February 2011, after Benucci returned to Tunis from two years of exile, we met again. Immediately following my interviews with three top Muslim brothers officials in Egypt, I quickly asked Benucci. 
what he thought about still unreputed, but no longer publicly embraced. But it wasn't reputed. It was still something on a draft, a draft platform of 2007. Um, concerning the ineligibility of women or Christians for an election as president. And then she responded immediately. Democracy means equality of all citizens. Such a platform excludes 60% of all citizens and must be unacceptable. He called, Gnucci calls himself an advocate of it as absolute equality, I don't believe it, but the absolute equality of men and women. Gnucci also said he entered in agreements, which were, I believe this because I have confirmed it, I have many, many documents about this, with a number of political parties as early as 2003, saying Inala would not try to reverse Tunisia's progressive family code if there ever were in March 2003. We talked about a proposed Sharia council in the Egyptian Muslim vote in 2007. Just as an example, they, they, they never embraced that finally, but it was something they put out for a while, um, whose function could possibly have been to review parliamentary legislation. And it was quite clear that he saw this as an unwarranted intrusion of religious authority on democratic authority, a violation of the Trump He insisted that neither he nor his party would push for such a body. In a subsequent May 2011 interview with Kanuchi, I asked if Inala was closer to the Egyptian mother of Muslim Brotherhood or the Turkish Justice and Democracy Party, AKP. The elected Secretary of General of Inala, now the Prime Minister of Tunisia, Amali Jabali, was also present. He chose to answer. I, this surprised me. I was totally focusing on religion. But then uh, uh, he said, move forward and told me to follow. He said, we are much closer to the AKP than to the Muslim Brotherhood. We are a civic party emanating from the reality of Tunisia, not a religious party. A religious, this is a quote. A religious party believes it has legitimacy not from God, not from the people, but from God. A religious party believes it has the truth, and no one can oppose it because it has the truth. Danucci concurred and refined the concept and added the, that the goal was a civic state, not a religious state. Both of them, at the conclusion of this, said, tell us more about Indonesia because we say we're closer, we know we're closer to Turkey than we are to uh, the Muslim brother in Egypt, but maybe we could even be closer to the Tunisian ones. It does talk a bit about that, and we, and we, we have someone coming, so you go for it, okay? So, <laughs> no, they, they want to hear about what's out there, the democratic and, 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 and Muslim. And, okay, now, many if not most sectors were still not convinced, but Inada was engaging in a public discourse about some of these issues. The civil military relations hypothesis. Obviously, the army and the Egyptian army is the eighth largest in the world. The United States gives 1.5 million billion dollars a year, 1.3 for the army. Everyone I talked to from the American government that started the transition said the most important thing is to avoid Iran, but we have to stay very close to our major partner, which is the army. They're beginning to rethink that in the last week or two. They're a big, heavy cost, but that's the way they saw. Nothing like this existed. There, there were, the army was only 35,000 in Tunisia. The secret police was 600,000. So, so if you have to choose between your part, uh, having your dictatorship being a party state or military backed, choose a party state. Because the party state will be backed by the police and security guards, and no one's going to like them. They can have no claims to represent all the country at all. Now, nonetheless, if they were really terrified and wanted the Brumarian, they could have asked, they could have asked uh, Rashid Maman, who was a very respected military person, if they were terrified and asked him, he would have done it. But they weren't that terrified and they didn't ask him why. So that gets us to the political society in the process. According to Jean Daniel, the French commentator and founder of the Observatory, the recent elections in Tunisia, this is in the New York New York Books for God's sake. Uh, this is in December 22nd, 2011. I'm a kill bomb. Uh, I mean, he never really should, but it, 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 the major thing they've written on Tunisia. And this is what, what uh, Jean Daniel says, that the recent elections in Tunisia amount to a counter-revolution, quote, an unfortunate, quote, manifestation of loyalty to tradition instead of, quote, triumph of liberty. Now, it would appear that Daniel writes that the elections could only have counted as an advance of liberty if they had followed the script of a French model of 1905 Lucy Day. That is the most religious and unfriendly form of secularism of any West European democracy. And they're getting pumped in. Probably the most dangerous thing happening in Tunisia right now is French television. They're coming in and really obsessing like this, uh, working from the lazy family. 
Now, Setra model in its extreme form was imposed in Tunisia, uh, imposed from above by the authoritarian sector of the Okay. Why, why, despite all this, has Tunisia gone so good? The essence of his story, and I almost can say, I started my life as a journalist for the economist. This is a scoop. I'm going to tell you a scoop. <laughs> Nobody knows this. Nobody. Because, because they didn't want to tell people. And they didn't tell people, they didn't tell me in April. They didn't tell me in June. I only found this out in November. But they gave me the documents, and I talked to people from six different parties. So I have an extremely high level of confidence in what I'm going to say. What I'm going to say, what comes out is from 2003 on, four of the five parties that constitute 60% of all the seats in the Constituent Assembly met regularly and proposed an alternative. They, Basically, they were amazingly like This started eight years before the transition. That these conversations and agreement that we share more against the common enemy than we hate each other. That was the same thing that the Chilean socialists had to do with the Christian Democrats, starting eight years ahead of them. And it's stunningly similar uh, from the viewpoint of democratization, how much creation of political society. Now, some of the documents, I have these documents. Um, Uh, one of the documents says, the 2003 document, it's called uh, The Call from Tunis, June 2003. People signed it. Very dangerous to sign this in 2003. Uh, it, it, uh, the preamble call for building upon the work and arguments of the great progressive constitutional architects of state religious neutrality in the 19th century, a career of being. And then they also talked about the major advocate for equality of women, Tahar Haddad, uh, who was a major figure there. The call from Tunis went on to say and endorsed specifically two fundamental principles of twin tolerations. One, any future elected government would be, and, and now they knew exactly what they were signing, they signed it, founded on the sovereignty of the people as the sole source of the Jews. So no kidding at all that God makes laws. Now it's man make the sole source of legitimacy for people in elections. They signed that. And two, that the state would guarantee religious faith and right of exit for, for everybody and would be politically neutral in their laws regarding religion. Okay, further, the call from Tunis demanded the full equality uh, of men for their own sake, and I think Anada signed this uh, to lessen the Vermeerian temptation that the secularists would have if they really felt the progressive right for women. Uh, many of the people, there'd be an authoritarian coalition uh, in the name of defensive secularism. Uh, from 2005 on, they began to meet more often. They formed a group called the 18th October Coalition for Rights and Freedoms in Tunisia. And they once had a three month on and off dialogue in the south of France, in which most other religious parties were there, three years before the transition. Uh, they came to a consensus on a number of things. They had were three pages to the equality of women. This is, you know, really, and, and, and not a signs off on And the document states that any future democratic state must be a civic state drawn as legitimacy from the will of the people. That's another assertion of that, of a civic state, and on. Now, I'm not arguing that a fully developed political society existed in Tunisia before the fall of Benali, but I'm arguing that the four parties are now in, the, the three parties in the coalition have been in an intellectual exchange since uh, 2008. They very quickly, the, the government did exactly the sort of thing that might have done in many places. They wanted a quick election with the existing president, the, the, someone from Benalese, out of re elected. Fascinating. Civil society in the first protest caused by one, went right in front of the prime minister's house and protested like that. But political society also protested. So political and civil society reinforced each other, and within four days, they gave up that idea of an experts committee draw the draft of to draw the, the rules of the game. So then they created what is called the Ben Ashur Commission. I've talked to many of the people in the Ben Ashur Commission, political parties, civil society, and I talked with Ben Ashur himself for five hours. And I talked with some of the experts on it, and I got documents from everyone. They did nine key things. Seven, they did seven fundamental things, which I think is pretty extraordinary. Um, one, the commission recognized Many changes were important for improving Tunisian consolidated democracy. 
however, they correctly agreed to concentrate as a body only on the decisions that were indispensable for creating a government, a democratic government, to make these uh, reforms. You know, what sort of vote you have? What office are you going to vote for? Are you going to have an observance? That's what you have to do. So they made a distinction between importance and indispensable. And I said, we, we have to do the indispensable quickly. It was a brilliant decision. Secondly, they said, which office should be elected first? They decided, as in India and as in Spain, that the first election should be for a constituent assembly. They were absolutely against having the first election be for president. They said, let's not even have to talk about elections for president. Because if there is a possibility of an election for president, we're going to get something like Egypt, where a lot of the people then don't join parties, run as independents, and so it's, an, it, it's a party of voting phenomenon to have an early vote for presidentialism. And then it's a parliamentary constraining phenomenon to have a sitting president with substantial powers while you're writing, while you're writing. So they said, no, we're not going to. The election is going to be for a constituent assembly who will appoint the government. And it will be like Spain and India. It's subject to a vote of no confidence. So the government right now is a subject to a vote of no confidence. OK. Third decision. It was agreed that, uh, that, that was another big decision was the electoral law. They, this was a brand decision. Uh, I had some slight role in this because I at least knew what different types, and they said, well, you know, what if you have a sing French, if you have a British type single member district, single member district, one person, first plurality, as opposed to PR. Free and fair elections, it'd be absolutely free and fair. But if you have single member districts, first plurality, and Nava almost certainly will win between 90 and 100% of all the seats in the constituency. They're going to be the first plurality in most places. If you have PR, I don't think they're going to get over 40%. Mm -hmm. They have 39%. But, uh, if, 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 uh, and they have 41% of the seats. If you have 41% of the seats, you're missing 9% of the former majority. You'd have to have a coalition with two other parties. Mm -hmm. Huge. They knew they were making that decision. They voted for it. Uh, they voted for it because a majoritarian constitution, they, they could have had 100% or 90%. It's not It's not clear. Have to, we'll have to look through absolute breakdown. I think not 100%. I think it would be close to 90%. OK. Um, then, to ensure the strong participation of women, uh, they aimed at zipped Closed list. Not 50% women, because then 50% women will be at the bottom and zero will be elected. It's every other name had to be a woman. Uh, it didn't get 50% because they made, they made one big mistake. Consciously or unconsciously. They should have said every other list has to start with a woman. Because in fact, almost no list started with a woman. So the rule of odd numbers, one, three, five. If they start with a man, one, three, and five are all men. So you have two women. They just systematically uh, and, and if you only get one, it's a man. So if so, they have 25% women, which is which is good, right? but it could have been 50 if it, was, if it had been zipped. Every other was starting with a woman, but it, but it was a, they have a great discussion like this. By the way, the first party that supported this, everyone agrees, and Nava was the first party that supported it. Because Anada said we can't we can't contribute to a sense of Algeria, and, and the West and everyone and panic, internal panic and external panic. And, and we, we can live. We have to contribute to a process of democracy. On, on, and the last thing on, on, on uh, external observers, uh, they said, look, the more the merrier. Because none of us know how this thing's going to go out. None of us really know how to. We're all living in uncertainty. And uh, if you're living in uncertainty, we should agree that we need some domestic and external observers. In Egypt, the military said this is a violation of sovereignty to have external observers. They finally allowed people in who were called followers. I've been an external observer. The, the, the followers in Egypt did not have anywhere near the power I had as an external observer in Chile. And as the external observers have in Tunisia. So the external observers happened. On the question of Ben Ali's government party, they decided not to totally abolish it and never allowed the them to go in because this may create a people outside of the democratic process. That they, so they allowed them to create it, and they created three or four parties. They didn't do traditionally well. There were a very small list of people who were leaders at the last government who could not run for the first constituent assembly. Okay. Now, um, on April 11th, less than four months after this starts, 
155 members of the Shore Commission voted on this package of measures to create a democratic transition. There were two walkouts, two abstentions. All the others voted for the package. Solidaristic jubilation ensued, clapping, hugs, and singing of the national anthem. Now, uh, this doesn't mean you don't have democracy. Uh, democracy is a democracy pro tem only until the next government. Uh, and the next government may happen in 18 months. Everyone believes that there, there will be free and fair elections, and there will be an election between 15 and 18 months. Everyone feels that they have a pretty good chance with some of their allies in it. So from that viewpoint, the fact that it's coalition requiring and coalition sustaining to some extent, and that everyone, Linz and I use a funny word, that democracy is not consolidated unless it's the only game in town. We don't believe there's a majority of Democrats in any country in the world. We believe in the, at the start of the country. We believe the process helps create Democrats. And so uh, the process that will create Democrats here, people say, everyone believes that they have a chance of winning the next time, so they're in the game. Every political party president I talked to was spending eight hours a day organizing the elections in 18 months. Well, that's what I'd like them to do. That's a hell of a lot better than probably the coup or something else. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.